Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a couple of our center. My name is Arthur Flug, and I'm the director here. And today we're doing something unusual that's never been done before. Because of a grant that we have received from an organization known as the National Endowment for the Humanities, we are able to put together a program that has to do with understanding who we are, what we do. Today's program is called Being Other. And when we look around, we found out something you already know, that there are a lot of people on campus who would say other. I had a class last semester that dealt with hate crimes, and I said to the people, identify yourselves. And one young lady said, I'm gay. And another man said, I'm a Muslim. And another person said, uh, well, I'm not a Muslim, and I'm, not, I'm probably atheistic. And then someone said, uh, uh, I'm straight. Another person said, I'm an American. Another person said, I'm an Afro-American who came from Haiti. And I said to them, well, what, what am I? And one of them said, you're an old man. <laughs> but I would, which is fine. I would say that. Uh, so what we're here today to do is to have a group of instructors from campus and a group of visiting instructors from other organizations and other campus come here to meet with you today to discuss issues of what it means being other. And I'd like to introduce Keith Tobias, who is going to be the moderator. So I'm going to stand up. I always wanted to be a stand-up comedian. This is the close I ever seem to get. But so I'm going to talk about, you know, talking about other. I'm going to be talking about transgender people. Uh, this year marks the 25th year since I graduated from college. 
a lot has changed in those 25 years, certainly for me, and also for transgender people. 25 years ago, it was virtually unknown for someone who was trans to be out on a college campus. Today, it's the opposite. It's virtually unheard of for a campus not to have out trans students on it. I do a lot of work in this area, I do a lot of consulting. I get calls all the time from all sorts of schools, from military academies, religious schools, schools in the most conservative rural areas that are trying to be supportive of a trans student who's come out on their campus. So we really are everywhere. If there is a campus that doesn't have someone out, I, I guarantee you they have students who are in the closet who don't feel comfortable being out on the campus. So that's a huge change from 25 years ago. Another huge change from, from 25 years ago, or even 15 years ago when I first began to identify as, as transgender, was that back in the day, there were pretty much two choices. If you're a transgender, you were either TS, transsexual, or CD, a cross-dresser. And if you're gonna have surgery in the near future, that puts you over here, otherwise you were a cross-dresser. So when I came out and began to identify as somebody who was not part of a gender binary, who felt more, more female than male, who didn't cross-dress, wasn't interested in, in wearing female attire, uh, but wasn't planning either to go on hormones and to transition to female, people didn't know where to put me. I was part of a transgender support group, which was made up primarily of trans women, both cross-dressers and transsexual individuals who were at that time in their, in their 40s and, and 50s, and I was in, in my uh, early, early 30s, they didn't get it. Because for their experience, when they came of age, that was what you did. You were a cross-dresser, you were transsexual. There was no middle ground, there was no other ground to stand on. So they didn't know what to do with me. And it was really bizarre in that I was out to non-transgender people, to my colleagues, and I got much more respect and support from them in my gender identity than I did from the trans people who still referred to me as using male pronouns and, and, and sir and mister and all that kind of stuff. When my non-trans, my cisgender colleagues and friends were really trying to understand my identity and using gender inclusive pronouns and, and really trying to respect me. So it was really interesting that the people who I should have had the most bond with, the most of a community with, were the people who were least part of that community. But thankfully, they, they changed. You know, they, I, I broke them in. They got, you know, figured out over time, you know, as, as they saw other people like me, that I wasn't just this one person who felt this way, that there was a whole world of people out there who identified as gender non-conforming outside of a gender binary. And now, thankfully, there are a lot more younger people who are very much out as part of a, a gender non-conforming or, or not part of a gender binary. Uh, the research that I did for my book, The Lives of, of Transgender People, with my, my colleague Sue Rankin, we, it's based on a study of 3,500 trans people. It's the largest book-length study of, of trans people that's been done. We asked the question, quite simply, how do you identify your gender. We had more than a hundred different responses to that question. Okay? Just shows you the complexities of gender and how people identify their gender. Really makes a mockery of having forms that say M or F. So we're seeing a whole range of gender possibilities, particularly on college campuses. I would say that on most college campuses, the majority of students who identify as transgender identify as gender nonconforming, is not part of a gender binary, often identifying as being genderqueer. That is, they identify as both male and female, as neither male nor female, but as a different gender, 
or is somewhere in between. Unfortunately, campuses and the world really are, are not equally safe spaces for, for people and for trans people. That on college campuses we see many more individuals who are identifying as trans who come from a female gender assignment, who identify now as being male or identify as not female and identify as something outside of male and female. It's still not a very safe place on most campuses for trans women or male assigned individuals like myself who identify as other than male. You know, society still does not have a space for us. You know, I, I often joke that I'm the oldest living gender queer male bodied person. Yeah. That's changing, but it's, it's slowly changing. The, the research that I did, people who are trans identified begin to recognize themselves as gender different about the age or four or five, which is in keeping with other research that has been done. Now that, that four or five year old doesn't have a name for what's happening, doesn't necessarily know what's going on, but feel themselves in some way to be gender different from their peers, from other kids that they play with. What happens, or what has happened, is that that young person has to hide who they are, has to go in denial, particularly if they are male assigned and identify as being feminine or female. Yeah. All of the people whom I interviewed for the trans book who were male assigned, who identified as female, were punished for it. If they were caught cross-dressing or if they didn't know any better, I guess you might say, and told their, their family that, that, that they really were, were girls or that they identified as female. They were all punished for it. They were sexually assaulted, physically assaulted, uh, sent to therapists to be cured, institutionalized. All of them across the board had some way that they were shut down and had to repress who they were. A bit different for the female assigned individuals who identified as masculine or male. Because in most US cultures, there's a space for that. You could be tomboys and will be tolerated, maybe even uh, accepted or, or glorified for that, at least until you become a teenager, reach puberty, and then gender roles, gender expectations narrow considerably. But still much more of a cultural space for young girls to be masculine presenting than for young boys to be female presenting. But that's, that is thankfully beginning to change as we're seeing really a generation of parents who's understanding more about this phenomenon of transgender, recognizing that it is an identity, it's not necessarily a phase that someone is going through and being more supportive, particularly of male assigned children who identify as being female. So we're really seeing the first generation of trans kids who can be trans kids or be the gender they feel themselves to be and not have to be this other gender that they don't relate to. So we're seeing teenagers who are able to transition and not have to go through the wrong puberty. Let me tell you, it's a lot harder to have to add things or take things off than not having to have them in the first place. So we're really seeing a generation of, of trans people who, in a, in a sense, aren't really trans because they can be who they see themselves to be. They don't have to, to transition because they've always been that. Remarkable. You know, I never would have imagined that 20 years ago when I first started getting involved in doing this sort of stuff. Never would have imagined that. Not in my lifetime, certainly. We're also seeing, you know, that, that, that four or five-year-old maybe not a four or five, but not much older than that, can go online. You know, there's this thing called the internet, which didn't exist in, in my day. You know, changed, it's changed everything, really, because now that individual who feels gender different at four or five can go online and understand what's going on, not have to spend years or, or decades even wondering, what's wrong with me? Am I the only one who's like this? In the book, I, people who I interviewed, I heard so many just 
horrific and, and tragic stories of particularly trans women, but some trans men as well, who spent decades and decades not knowing what was going on with them, did not know that other people liked themselves, did not know that it was possible if they wanted to, to transition. It wasn't until they got online, until the internet existed, that they could see that there were other people like themselves. Oh my God, I'm not the only person who's like this. There's a whole world, there are whole communities just like me out there, and I can be part of that. So people in their 50s, 60s, 70s transitioning because they could finally be themselves. They recognized that there was a way that they could be true to themselves, and they did not want to to die in a body that was not authentic to themselves. You know, very different today when you have the ability to be online and discovering that there's this term transgender and a whole host of other terms. When you can be talking to trans people from around the world, just has changed everything. You know, and also people aren't as confused. You know, for a lot of people who are identified, who were male assigned, who identified as, as female, many thought that they were cross-dressers at first. Made sense, I'm attracted to, to the to feminine things, to female, I like to dress as female, I must be a cross-dresser. It wasn't until later on that they realized there's more to it than that, I, I want to be female. It's not just a question of, of wearing feminine attire, I want to be female. You know, very different when you have the resources to better understand yourself. Or for the individuals who were female assigned, who were attracted to women. Many first thought that they were butch lesbians. Again, seemed to make sense. You know, I can be, you know, I can be presenting very masculine and, and be, attract, be involved with, with women. It wasn't until they began to be in the lesbian community and recognize that, no, I'm different from butch lesbian. I, want, I feel myself to be male, that they transition. You see, we see a lot less confusion today with the resources that are available to young people. And I don't mean to you know, paint this as a rosy picture for young people today. There's an incredibly high suicide rate among young trans people. There's a great deal of depression among young trans people. So I don't mean to say that it's, a, it's easy to be a trans person, you, a trans youth today. But there's more resources that are readily available. No matter where you are, you could find community, if only online. It's very different when, when back in my day, when there weren't even, there wasn't an internet, there weren't even books available, you know, that, that were supportive of, you, of how you identified. You know, so very, it's very, very different. And for young people who, who don't have the support of family, who don't have the means to be able to, to present as how they identify or to, to transition if that's what they want to do. So we're seeing more and more coming out in college, which again, as I mentioned at the very outset, is a very relatively recent phenomenon. It used to be back in my day because people were, were in denial, really, repressing who they were, that they did not come out until mid midlife. You know, they were evaluating who they were, where they wanted to go with the rest of their life. Maybe they, their kids were grown. Maybe they, a marriage had, had ended. They were trying to evaluate themselves, and, and Cain, you know, had that moment of truth. Very different today, where people are having the resources, can, can know about other trans people, and so don't have that, those years and years of, of wondering. You know, it was fascinating to interview, particularly, particularly the trans, trans women for the book, um, who, many of whom, if, if they were in their 40s or, or 50s, had the most masculine of backgrounds. They were almost invariably ex-military. Um, they were firefighters and police officers, race car driver. You know, they, they did the most macho things they could do. Why? Because they were so in denial 
about who they were. They were trying to run as far from they, as they could from who they were. So they were trying to, as much as possible, deny to themselves and to anyone around them that they could possibly be female. Very, very different today. Unfortunately, most, most colleges aren't ready for, for trans people. Most colleges don't have the resources, the, the support services in place for trans people. I hear, I, this is what I do for a living, is basically counsel colleges about how they could be more trans supportive. And we have a long, long way to go. You know, in, I was involved in 1996, at, at, I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa. We were the very first college to add gender identity to our non-discrimination policy. 1996, you know, yesterday pretty much. And today we only have 700 and some colleges that have even, even taken that basic step to be inclusive to say we will not discriminate against trans people, let alone being supportive in other ways and making it clear that we support having trans students at our institution, that we're going to provide the resources to make that, make that happen. So it's still, unfortunately, a very difficult environment at, at colleges for, for many trans students, even though more and more are coming out and, and looking for that kind of support at, at colleges. So, I'm hoping that but this, my talk today you know, opens up a little bit more understanding of, of trans people and, and the need to be supportive and have the resources available. And I think I will, since I'm running out of time, I will, I will end, it, end it there. That's all I have to do? That, that was easy. <laughs> I am also going to stand because I think I'll, I'll hide, I'll get hidden behind all of this. Oh. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll have to hold it far away. So, um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so many of my students for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to my fellow speakers, really fantastic. Really appreciate uh, all the um, bravery and outspokenness and hearing all these sort of different uh, opinions today that relate to this idea of what it means to be different or to feel different, to feel like other. Uh, and I think one of the things that we start to notice is that um, in some way, we, a lot of us are an other. So maybe if we start to recognize that, then we are not alone. <laughs> Our differences, yes, they might be different, but we are joined sometimes in that feeling of marginalization, of alienization, of feeling put down or unheard or unable to speak. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit today about something that sort of relates to very specifically to us here in New York City. Uh, and that's the NYPD stop and frisk program. Uh, and I just want to give us some updates, some facts about the program, what we found out, and some updates about the recent um, court case and city appeals and the dropping of city appeals and, and what that means. Uh, it's very much a point, a place of action right now for our communities and for New York City concerning, um, concerning the police. We've never really had this opportunity before. We've never had such an open administration that is willing to ask, okay, what improvements need to be made? What do you think police should do? And how should they do it? We've never had really a, a, an administration in the city that is so open to hearing from its community members and has acknowledged the problems and the racial profiling within the stop and frisk system. That is, that acknowledgement has never been made before just a couple weeks ago. As much as we may have seen it in the streets or felt it ourselves, we've never had our officials back us up. Uh, so let me just back up just a little bit. Uh, I teach in the English department and I also occasionally teach uh, an English 101 class for criminal justice majors that is paired with criminal justice 101. And that's how I started with this issue. And I thought it would be an interesting thing for us to discuss in class. And little did I know when I asked my students how many of us have been stop and frisked, 
I was overwhelmed. <laughs> So many people in the classroom, so many stories, people telling me that they've been stopped over and over again. And I realized that I needed to do, do more research, be involved, see what was going on uh, with my students. And in my neighborhood, but not to me. So I wanted to kind of um, really find out more. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what some of those statistics are. Like I said, you know, I teach this English 101 class for criminal justice majors, and I often have, you know, maybe three quarters of the room who say that they want to be police officers. <laughs> and people will give a lot of reasons. Early retirement, number one. <laughs> Early retirement, the pay, the stability, the idea of people who just want to help their community. Okay, I mean, that's, that's always there at its core. There are other jobs with early retirement. There are other jobs with good pay. But there's something else about the motivation to be a part of your community. Uh, also, TV shows don't help. Say, so kind of make it look a little exciting, too. <laughs> uh, but, you know, then I turn around and I ask, well, how many of us have uh, maybe a negative or a disparaging view of police officers. And everybody raises their hands. The same people who moments ago told me they want to be police officers. So how do we, how do we reconcile those things? Uh, and a lot of times people say, well, I want to become a cop because I want to change it. I want to do something different. And I'm not going to do these stop and frisks. And I'll, since the stop and frisk program really began, began in force in the early 90s, 91, 92, there have been a lot of cops who have said that. But unfortunately, with this policy in place, the pressure, even people who did not want to make stops, were sort of forced into feeling like they had to. You know, when you are a police officer to be promoted, to move up in the force, uh, you want to impress your supervisors. You want to, uh, you want to do your job well. And it started to seem as though there, were, uh, there was a numbers game. The more stops, the better police officer you are. And when it comes to being a cop, there's no quotas. If there's no crime, that's a good day. <laughs> if we don't arrest someone someday, that should be a good day. That shouldn't be a bad day at your job. You know what I'm saying? So that, that, that's kind of an interesting sort of take. And there's no... Uh, there were no official quotas related to stop and frisk, but some police officers who really felt like they were being pushed to do things they didn't want to do started recording their, uh, their meetings, their work meetings. And it turned out that some of the language, and it was played in court this summer as part of Floyd versus New York City, the big lawsuit related to stop and frisk, and they caught supervisors on tape saying things like, we need, we need more arrests, we need higher numbers, go out and get some number one males. Number one male is an African-American male age 14 to 21. The idea being, we can justify any stop. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we see this, this sort of discomfort, this tension between police and communities, but it's, not, it's also police who are unhappy with this circumstance. That's not why people took the job. That's not, that's not serving the community in the way that they, they wanted. And yet, when we talk about these issues, it's so much vitriol, so much sort of violent language on both sides. We have a, we have a broken relationship in our communities. We don't see police officers as community members of our community anymore, as people involved in a community service, right? We see policing as something different than community service. Now, why, why is that, right? And for those of us who are interested in just uh, some of the numbers, so 2011 was our worst year, quote unquote, for stop and frisk on the books. Uh, New York City stopped 685,000 people that year, close to 700,000 people that year. That's upwards of 1,500 a day, a day. Um, and we might say, well, there's a lot of people in New York City, millions of people. That doesn't sound like so much. But it's not spread out evenly over the city. So in some neighborhoods, no one stopped for days. <laughs> and in some neighborhoods, the same people are stopped over and over and over. So the numbers are very helpful. They can also be kind of deceiving. So we have to look a little deeper into the numbers. Now, though 
Black and Latino youth only count for about 4.7% of the city's population, which might be surprising to us. Uh, black and Latino males between 14 and 24 account for 40.6% of the stops. So 4.7% of our population makes up 40% of that big number that I just gave you. That, that really tells us something about how we view our young people in New York City. And that's a dangerous thing because these young people are going to grow up and then and, and, and be in charge of our city and what kind of attitudes are we engendering and what kind of relationships are we forming in our communities. Now, in 2011, the number of stops of young black men in New York City was almost equal to the number of, men, of young black men in New York City, meaning we stopped everyone, meaning that everyone was stopped once, and those who weren't, we stopped someone else twice. <laughs> that's, that's really crazy. There's no other population number where we can do that one-to-one -one like that, and not even close, not even close. So that tells us something about our gaze, the way we look at people the kind of stereotypes and attitudes hiding behind it all. Uh, the Nation magazine is like a newspaper magazine. It's been around for a long, long, long time. And they've done a lot with Stop and Frisk. And they put together a video that some of you guys might have seen on YouTube or on Facebook. It was a really big deal last, last year uh, about a young man named Alvin from Harlem who um, was stopped twice in the same night walking home from his girlfriend's house. He actually had been an explorer, the Young Policeman's Program, and his father was a transit cop. Uh, and still he had this, this kind of animosity and this tension and this anxiety every time he saw a police officer. And when he saw that they were coming to stop him for the second time, he, um, he actually uh, pulled out his phone and he recorded them. And it was one of the first times that we had uh, a recording of stop and frisk. You're not, you, this is something that the New York Civil Liberties Union challenged. Police used to take the phone from you or tell you to stop recording. And actually that's unconstitutional. You, ha you sh are able to record that. And so he recorded uh, his treatment. He was not arrested. He was doing nothing wrong. Uh, police asked him why he had a backpack on. His backpack is suspicious. Why does he have a hooded sweatshirt in his backpack and he's not wearing it? The weather was not enough of an answer. They uh, used the F word continually when he did not. They twisted his arm behind his back and made fun of his dad for only being a transit cop. And then they let him go. And many people say, well, what, is, what does it matter if you're not doing anything? Why get stopped? You know, I think about uh, this city has a program called Operation Clean Halls. It's very related to Stop and Frisk program. We sometimes see those signs, Operation Clean Halls, on buildings. And what that means is that the police can police the hallways of the buildings the way they police the street. Uh, and that's not all buildings in New York City. Uh, but we, as part of the Floyd versus New York City, which was a civil lawsuit, people banded together to sue the city for civil rights violations. And one of the men named in the suit, he had been stopped repeatedly in the hallway of his building, helping his neighbor get in when his neighbor couldn't find the keys in the purse. He got a trespassing citation outside his door. And he said, hey, I live here. They said, I already wrote the paper, here it is. These things really on a practical level also cost the city money money we don't have, money that could go into community support programs. All, many times, you know, if someone gets a trespassing ticket, trespassing in public housing that they live in, then you have to take a day off work. You go to court, the judge is paid, the lawyer's paid. Every, there's a stenographer typing everything. She gets paid too. You stand up there, you say, I lived in the building. The judge says, case dismissed. And that costs us in the city. And now, your name is in a database, even if you weren't doing anything wrong. So if you get stopped again, your name comes up in the database. Hey, you get stopped a lot. What's your crime other than living in New York City, not on the Upper East Side? <laughs> uh, so that, that's also a big part of that. And right now, uh, you know, our former administration was fighting the, the judge's decision, fighting very, very actively. 
Uh, Mayor de Blasio announced on January 30th that the city was dropping its appeal of the lawsuit and that they accepted the terms. He actually stood at a press conference and said that yes, the NYPD has racially profiled. We've never had an administrator stand up and say something like that before. He also said that he agreed with the judge's terms that we need to reform the NYPD. And he asked the community to let him know, to let us know, to let the city know, what, what does policing mean? What do we want our police to do? What do we want that relationship to be? The rule book is out with new guidelines. If we create those guidelines, is it possible to police in New York City without racially profiling? Is it possible to stop, question, and frisk without racially profiling? Because the program still exists. It just cannot be carried out in the same way. So what does that mean? And those of us in here who are criminal justice majors, that's the question for you. When you now become police officers, what, how is that possible? How do we do that and how do we train officers to do that? Uh, the last thing I'm gonna say, this is just from the New York Times. I have tons of resources for anybody who wants to uh, talk to me after. I can show you all kinds of video and websites. But this is some of the reasons why when people are stopped, these are the top reasons that are written on the ticket. And you see the number one reason is furtive movement. And that means look suspicious, moving suspiciously. And people's prejudices and deep held stereotypes, that's gonna impact what I think of as suspicious. I'm gonna carry that right out there on the job with me. And it's very vague, it's very vague. It's basically a catch-all that says, I can stop whoever I want, right? So how do we begin to change this so that it, this list represents something that's actually beneficial to our, to our communities, stopping people for a reason, right? Uh, like I said, for people who are interested in this, um, I encourage you to ask questions. And like I said, I'm, I encourage you to, to be involved, to go to your community board, newyorkcity.gov, go and type in your zip code and it'll tell you who your community board, where they are, who they are, and how you can get involved. But I'm happy to help too. <laughs> Thanks guys, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jessica. And, no problem. Um, our uh, hello, everyone. I will be um, sitting. Those who can't see me, I'm sorry for being short. Um, but let's get started. Okay. Uh, when we think of the other, I get the feeling we think of marginalized groups. And in this country, uh, that generally means ethnic minorities, women, the handicapped, uh, people with psychological problems, people with learning disorders, autism or Asperger's, immigrants, the transgendered, gays and lesbians, non-English speakers, uh, poor people, and finally adjunct lecturers who are also poor people. Um, but marginalized how exactly? Uh, these are groups who are excluded, maligned, mistreated, threatened, abused, uh, and even occasionally exiled or even killed for being part of this other group. Uh, there's another group that I think fits these above criteria, truth tellers. Uh, yeah, people who tell the truth, I think, are often excluded, maligned, occasionally exiled, and sometimes even killed. It seems like a radical idea. Uh, well, until at least you, until you look at the people whose job it is to tell the truth. Uh, journalists, teachers, whistleblowers, and even that friend who tells you that you're in a bad relationship. Uh, these are people who tell us what we don't want to hear, and they open themselves up to a lot of resentment because of it. Uh, because I'm mostly a writer, uh, most of my evidence will be anecdotal, specious, reckless, and vague, but please uh, bear with me. Uh, to wit, Oscar Wilde, famous author, once said, uh, if you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. Uh, also, H.L. Mencken, who's one of history's best curmudgeons, uh, look it up, uh, tells us the men that American people admire most extravagantly are the most daring liars. Uh, the men they detest most violently are those who try to tell them the truth. Uh, and Mencken, who was a reporter during the Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, where scientific fact had to gain the support of the U.S. government in order to be shared with other people, uh, had a pretty good view of how hard it is to get people to listen to the truth. Uh, also, we learned from a great book, I've used it in class many times, The Power of Persuasion by Robert Levine, that it's actually dangerous to be a weatherman, or a meteorologist, rather, 
uh, in Alaska, and it's not exactly the weather. Uh, and this is absolutely true. People send in letters uh, full of sound and fury, signifying a lack of understanding of causality, that if it snows just one more day, they're coming down to the station and beating up the meteorologist. Uh, and this is absolutely true. Uh, but also, a little bit more seriously, think of the three, I guess, latest or biggest whistleblowers in the news. Uh, Edward Snowden, uh, Bradley Manning from the Army, and Julian Assange from WikiLeaks. Uh, while all three have their supporters all across the world, they also have something in common. No, none of them can walk on U.S. soil as free men. Uh, and as a student uh, back at John Jay, I was lucky enough to actually meet Frank Serpico. Not Al Pacino, but the actual Frank Serpico, uh, who was actually shot in the face for his trouble exposing corruption in the NYPD, uh, the Knapp Commission, way back when. And he told us 20 years afterwards that he was still getting death threats and he still was afraid to live in the United States. The threats were coming from current and former NYPD officers. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty strong thing. But while the public battles are interesting and a little bit easier to research, I think it's more interesting to see how the personal battles play out. Uh, how we, ourselves, us, you and me right here, um, how do we react to the truth? Uh, of course, a pleasant truth, you know, something nice, you know, oh, you look good today. Uh, it's easy to bear, it's easy to share, it's easy to, um, it's just easy to take. And that right there is, I think, the crux of our reaction. It's not necessarily the truth we dislike. Uh, it's the unpleasantness, the pain, the fear, the suffering, anger, other things that Yoda says. Uh, we don't like bad news, but the problem is, of course, uh, that the truth is not always that pretty and happy. Um, of course, People do react well to, well, some people uh, react well to the truth, but I think it takes a certain level of work and maturity to get there. Uh, none of us, I think, enjoy being told that we're, say, overweight, short, yeah. uh, weird looking, not that smart, not that attractive, or in other words, or in other ways, kind of just flawed or imperfect, even though we all are to some degree. We're all kind of the other to somebody else. Uh, and in fact, if you say these things, these maybe hard truths, uh, often enough and with a mean intent, that is the definition of emotional abuse. Telling the truth in the wrong way and too harshly is actually, and I'm not making fun of it, this is true. Uh, you tell people certain things about themselves, it becomes abusive. It's an odd situation. Uh, but I don't think this reaction has gone unnoticed. Uh, what staggers me, personally, uh, is how hard we work as a society to avoid telling the truth, uh, or at least being hurt, hearing the truth, at least the unpleasant stuff. Entire industries uh, are either devoted to telling us bald-faced lies or just twisting the truth until it becomes palatable. Uh, the easy example, of course, is advertising. I love watching it, uh, not because I want to buy things, but because of the messages they're in. Uh, for instance, uh, let's see, if you buy a car, all of a sudden you're 20 years younger. Uh, if you buy, you know, and that fifth blade on a razor is the difference between the happily ever after or living alone. Uh, at least according to the commercials. Uh, let's see, where else do we have? Uh, oh, of course, and just because it was just Valentine's Day, the only way, the only appropriate way to show your love uh, is to buy many, many diamonds. And yes, if he doesn't buy you diamonds, and it's always he buying, uh, him buying her a diamond, he doesn't really love you, uh, at least according to the ad. Uh, and of course, one of my favorites, though, is that eating McDonald's makes you smart. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has seen those commercials. Um, of course, the biggest lie is that McDonald's is actually food, uh, but we'll pass that. But my absolute favorite actually came on a chocolate bar, uh, a Dove bar, uh, and it said, chocolate always loves you back. Uh, and it's just, it was about five years ago, and it's going to be imprinted in memory forever, um, especially when we're lonely. Uh, but of course, and there is, besides advertising, there's the mire of uh, politics. Uh, which, according to George Orwell, who hopefully some of you have read, if you ever take me as a teacher, you will. Uh, he calls politics and political language the defense of the indefensible. Uh, and I actually have an assignment, so if you're thinking about it, uh, where students have to take a modern political speech and analyze it, point out all the deceptions and manipulations, the twists and the turns, the spin. Uh, and you might think, well, this is a pretty complex uh, assignment for freshmen. But there's so much deception and manipulation in the speech that everyone gets through it pretty easily. Not that they really enjoy it at the time. Um, but my favorite, and we're talking about truth and lies, favorite political example comes from way back when, the 2002 State of the Union address, back when George Bush was president. And here's the opening line. It's, it's 
one of my favorite examples of just you know, cognitive dissonance of uh, how to quickly define it. Um, like I never got help from anyone as you're getting help from somebody as like well, Craig Nelson, the actor who played coach, favorite example is I was on food stamps and no one helped us out, uh, which is a great example, great definition of cognitive dissonance where you're arguing one thing, which is actually, it's an advanced form of hypocrisy. But anyway, here's the speech. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Vice President Cheney, members of Congress, distinguished guests, fellow citizens, and here's the kicker. As we gather tonight, our nation is at war, our economy is in recession, and the civilized world faces unprecedented dangers. Yet the state of our union has never been stronger. So think about that. Our nation is at war, our economy is in recession, and we face unprecedented dangers, but we've never been stronger. Now, the line itself kind of caught me off guard, but what really staggered me, uh, again, 12 years later now, I still can look at it and be amazed, was the audience reaction to it. You might say, well, that seems wrong, that does not follow, that is a non sequitur. Um, they didn't. They erupted with applause, with cheers. Everyone stood up. Everyone, yay! Tears were coming out of people's eyes. Um, people experienced things that I don't know if they can actually experience in public. Um, and it was not a political show. Uh, it was, really, it was, it was what the audience, what they wanted to hear, what they needed to hear. Uh, the nation had never felt weaker in my lifetime, probably most of our lifetimes, and the truth and that pain were happily dispelled, at least for a little bit. And while it's easy to blame the deceivers, and often enough we should, probably a lot more than we do right now, but their motivation is obvious. What I think is more puzzling and fun is our motivation to believe these lies. All right. Uh, and I think the answer is pretty simple but underestimated. We want to be happy, we want to be blissful, uh, we want to have pleasure. Uh, and add that to the ability to, I guess, choose what we want to believe. Uh, and we have, well, actually, the world of literature, believe it or not. Uh, for instance, when I just said we have to choose what we want to believe, especially if I say it a little bit more masculinely, um, you might think of The Matrix of Lawrence Fishburne. If I said Neo, you'd be like right there. Um, and no, I haven't forgotten the truth tellers. I just want to see how deep this rabbit hole goes. Uh, because yes, as much as we ostracize and distance ourselves from truth tellers, we cling to those who best uh, help us escape reality, at least for a little while. Uh, think of our best celebrities, our actors. Uh, let's see. So let's think about it this way. Uh, if you're enjoying a movie or a TV show and someone comes along and tells you the director beats his wife, and it's true, you've just lost a bit of happiness there. You've lost that escape. Um, and now, think about your feelings of the person who told you that. He didn't, the, the, the truth teller was not the one who's doing the beating. That person is just letting you know what's going on. But you now hate and resent that person a little bit. And I think that's really what it is. That's what faces the truth teller, is when somebody spoils our fantasy, we're mad at that person. Not because they're taking it, well, because they're taking it away. Even if it wasn't real, even if it was just a complete deception, something we told ourselves, that anger at basically waking up, think about a good dream and you're angry for being woken up by a loud sound, I think that is somewhat analogous to how we feel about the truth teller in general. Uh, and of course, the last question I have about this is, well, if it's so bad, if we're risking so much, so much anger, and if we look at the history of people who tell us the truth, the outcome is not always rosy, so why do it? Uh, and I guess I'll kind of fly through my answers here. I'm on my last page. Um, I think actually the, the desire to tell the truth is a little bit cynical. It was a little bit uh, selfish. Because when you're already alone, when you're already isolated, losing that extra little bit, when you're not allowed to talk about things, I guess the strongest example I have in the time I have now, is imagine you know somebody who is in an abusive relationship, okay, and sadly, most of us do. And if you don't know someone in a really, an abusive relationship, you know someone who does know someone. It's disturbing. But think about the pressure. I see my friend, she's in trouble, she's getting beaten, but she's so upset about it and she's so scared about talking about it that if I bring that up, I can lose the, the relationship altogether, which is why a lot of people stay silent. Uh, but think also of how much is lost uh, because you're not allowed to talk about the truth. And I think basically people will take that risk of isolation and of loss because they already feel it to some degree. They see what other people 
don't, and they're already isolated, uh, so they're willing to risk everything, uh, I guess, to get a little bit more, I guess, from being isolated and cut off. Uh, I think that's about my time. Okay, I had a little bit more, but thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Rosemary Akis with the uh, Criminal Justice Department, Social Science. Um, are you able to see? Actually, maybe I'll just come over here and because I want you to see the visuals um, as best as you can. Um, maybe we can go to the next one. So I'm here to talk about um, being other, and particularly within the criminal justice system. Um, and I thank you for inviting me. I really feel honored to be here. Um, just off the bat, there are 65 million Americans in this country who will never catch up to you. How do I, what do I mean? They have a criminal record. So by that reason alone, they will be considered other. And they will not compete for jobs with you. These are some of the companies that exclude. Okay? Come on, go to the next one. Um, be another in America. And I, I'm, I'm going to read some stuff to you, but I also want to kind of point out uh, this young sister, she was actually killed a block away from me in Harlem for being other, for being different. Um, because some people in the criminal justice system, once they leave the system, are considered other, and this is fueled by legal and regulatory barriers that prevent people who come home to enter into meaningful positions, meaningful housing. Um, they are excluded, including Section 8 housing, if you have a drug conviction or some kind of felony, being other. Um, the system uses language the criminal justice system inside and out to create categories for being different. We have offenders, we have welfare parents, we have drug dealers. Um, um, also, are you willing to invest in the identities of other people who look and act and maybe are different from you because of their contact with the criminal justice system? Are you willing to invest them and with them? Um, next one, please. Okay. Um, just want to read a couple of things for you. And this is from the Sentencing uh, Project website that you can go to later. Um, so there are roughly 5.85 million Americans, 5.85 million Americans, or one in 40 adults in this country who have currently or permanently lost their voting right, um, the ability to vote because of felony conviction. I come from a tiny country called Finland. Our population is 5.2 mil. So let's put it in context. If you visited my country, no one there could, be, could vote because they have a felony conviction. Staggering, is it not? Being other. We have 2.2 million African Americans in this country who are disenfranchised, meaning they cannot vote because they are other, meaning they have a felony conviction. In 2007, we have 1.7 million children in this country who have one or both parents in prison on any given day, being other. And I'll talk to you more about collateral consequences of incarceration and what it means to children because they too become other and they serve their time where? In the community. When mommy and daddy do, 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 uh, do time, they do that time too. Okay. And again, we have 65 million Americans with a criminal record. Okay. Um, talking about a little bit about social exclusion. Um, we are facing a crisis, and I'm talking about mass incarceration in this country. 
We have 2.3 million people who are sitting in our jails and prisons as we speak. 11,000 of them, not far from here, on Rikers Island. And if you look at a New York State, New York City map, look for Rikers Island. You won't find it. Being other, being invisible. How do we respond to our crisis when it comes to criminally speaking? We incapacitate. We also have what I would argue Oh, based on Saskia Assassin's um, um, research, we have master categories. You are above 65 million people. You are in an upper category. Why? Because you have no criminal record. Um, and people in these master categories can designate where any one of those 65 million people can live and work and earn their living, being other. Okay, can we go to the next one? Okay. A little bit about defining social exclusion. To me, social exclusion is the result of or can produce being other categories that are less than master status categories. Um, social exclusion is a complex process and it's multidimensional. It involves both lack and denial of resources rights, goods, and the ability to participate in a normal relationship and activities. It may include the, it, the person's inability to even get their children back. Did you know that in New York State, it's federal law actually, if a woman is sentenced to three or more years in prison, the state can automatically start adoption proceedings um, to place that child into a foster or adoptive home, regardless of the relationship the child has with his or her parent, be another. And you might one day be in those positions to make those policies. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about labeling. Um, we all have heard these terms, drug dealer, sex offender, ex-offender, drug addict, predator, habitual offender, thug, labels, and let me, othering and bordering are two important processes of exclusion. Labels exclude, do they not? If somebody's an ex-offender, when are we willing to drop the ex and the offender and look behind the labels and embrace them, who they are? and take the other out of the being and add human being. You ready to do that? <sighs> Labeling is done through invention of categorical categories and labels and ideas about what characterizes people belonging to these categories. And here just, we have a surplus population of individuals I'm just talking in terms of um, people who, because of their criminal record, are barred from applying for multitude of positions that require licensing, which if they have a conviction, they will never uh, be able to apply for those jobs and still never catch up to you. Okay, next one, please. Um, in terms of othering, Exclusion, we also have what's called bordering. It often accompanies othering and involves maintaining a spatial and symbolic borders or boundaries to keep people excluded. There are a lot of young people, people of all ages who would like to come to Queensboro Community College but may not be eligible for federal financial aid. Why? because they have to check that box for have you ever been arrested, being other, being excluded. They will not come here. Don't take your education for granted. These boundaries prevent people from equitable access to jobs, services, and political spaces. A person with a criminal conviction can serve on a jury. If you run for office one day, would you go to a neighborhood where 95% percent of the people in that space 
have records? Would you even go and visit them? See what their needs are? They can vote for you. Would you still go and make their needs and ideas and concerns visible? Would you do that? Or would you keep it moving to neighborhoods and areas where people can vote for you? Let's talk about the spatial of so, uh, social exclusion. Oh, this is um, discrimination and stigmatization by categorical, categorical, legal, and regulatory barriers. In this country, it's okay to discriminate against someone who has a record. Why? Because the laws allow that. Um, here's the spatial of social exclusion. Um, group boundaries. Let's talk about certain offenders who may not go to certain areas because of their records. Um, our laws, re uh, regulations, create rulings that say, in terms of educationally speaking, who can study and where. And if you have this mark on your record, you cannot come here. That's what we call by boundary making activities. And it's, it's just not the criminal justice system, it's the society at large. Legislators, lawmakers, constituents. Difference and in inequality to me equals othering. Um, they're excluded by way of being urban outcasts. They have no place in society. We have a new cat, new caste system. You are in the master category. People with records are over there. You're willing to go over there and find out what they need and want? They hide and appear due to private and public boundaries. People with criminal records may not even get public housing. How many people come home from our prisons and jails every day? annually in this country, roughly 700,000 people, 700,000 others. Are we willing to embrace them and take them in or keep them excluded and hold on to those labels? Okay, also occupational mobility is severely restricted. In many prisons in this country, men are taught how to cut hair they have barber shops, I visited, but when you come out, you need a license to be a barber. But if you have a record, what will you do? Next one. Okay, so to me, oh, this is so much. Um, to me, what the laws and regulations and rules are creating are in people who are incomplete citizens. You are a complete one. But we have millions of people in this country who are now incomplete citizens. We tell them where they can live, where they cannot work. We deny them political participation, economic deprivation. If you have a drug charge, you may not get public welfare. You may not get food stamps. We have to factor in race and gender. People of color are dispo disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system. They are segregated in urban environments. Let me ask you again, if you run for office one day, if you become an advocate, if you already are one, are you willing to hear the voices of the other and bring them from invisible to visible? You willing to do that? Are you? Their social world, the people who are other, their social world is fragmented. It's not fluid. I can go here, but I can't go there. My child can go there, but they can't go there. What will I do to become complete citizen? My question to all of us is, can we eradicate being other or do we emphasize being other? Next one. Oh, time is up.
One moment. Okay. Oh, let me just quickly, um, quickly um, want to talk to you a little bit about collateral consequences of incarceration. Um, this is just some statistics. Um, maybe you can go to the next one. Yeah, go to the next one, please. Okay. Here, I just want to ask you, where do you fit in this arena? Where do we fit in this arena? Are we willing to come from here to there and embrace people or not? Who are different, who've made mistakes. I'm not condoning criminal activity. What I do condone is that we're not able to take people back who want to be, re re to be rehabilitated and give them another chance. Can we take the last one? Okay. This. And I want to leave with this challenge to you. Are you willing to announce and denounce being other? Are you willing to, are we willing to stand for peace, development, and human rights? Can we become a culture of prevention to be proactive rather than reactive, hence creating lamp labels, hence creating masses of people who are being other? Are, are we willing to bond, link, and bridge gaps between others and us so that they can become visible through us? And my challenge to you is, let us begin to dismantle the notion of being other. Thank you. Yep. Uh, maybe I'm just going to sit, if, if you don't mind. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, I should say, to everybody. And let me start off by apologizing for being so late. It took me two and a plus hours to get here from City Hall, uh, but I made a commitment and I wanted to be here. And I really do believe that the topic for today, being other in America, is really vitally important to, to all of us and to the growth of New York City and to America as a whole. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Diane Call our president of uh, Queensborough for all that she does, and Dr. Arthur Flug as well for uh, running this Holocaust Center. And long before I was elected to the New York City Council, I was a member of the board of the Holocaust Center, and uh, to see what the Holocaust Center has become and how it's being used is, is a tremendous pleasure to me. So I want to thank all of you. And um, I just want to tell you, you know, if you look at me, I'm a white guy, you know, almost 60 years old, and what do I know about being other? So I learned about being other when I was very young because I felt that I was different. And my other for me is because I'm gay. And I'm gonna just tell you some of the experiences that I had growing up being gay and then even to the point of um, my career and then being elected as one of the first openly gay people to be elected in the borough of Queens. Um, you know, when I was young and in school, I used to get bullied all the time by other kids in the school. I didn't think I was particularly effeminate. I, don't still, I still don't think that I really am, although uh, sometimes I say it's not that I'm effeminate, it's just that I'm educated. And uh, people mistake one for the other. And, um, and, uh, but I was teased and harassed quite often for being different. And so I felt very early age that I was different, and I was felt... I was made to feel that I was other than. Uh, even in a pretty hom hom homogeneous environment, mostly white kids in a Catholic school in a Long Island neighborhood growing up basically in, in a similar type of uh, community where people were pretty much the same. Um, but I knew I was different. And in 1973, I went to a place called the Firehouse. Uh, the gay rights movement had just started and the firehouse was the home of uh, the gay rights movement at that time. It was in Soho on Wooster Street in Manhattan. And I knew that I had kind of found my people, so to speak. Um, uh, you know, I always wanted to kind of be involved. I had seen the civil rights movement happen in the 1960s. I saw the fight for African-American rights, for women's rights. But I was very much afraid, really, to speak up for my own rights as a gay person. Um, until I went to that firehouse and I saw other people who were like me 
willing to stand up and fight for our rights. Um, you know, being in, in a, I went to a Catholic college, Marist College up in Poughkeepsie, very conservative, uh, very, um, you know, um, much the same of the, the communities that I came out from. I was teased, I was harassed there. Um, but I started a gay organization up there in 1973 uh, when we were still on the list of mental disorders. It used to be that you were considered to be mentally ill by the American Psychiatric Association. And that's how they damaged our community and, 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 and put that label on our community. To me, in some ways, there's no label worse than to be called mentally ill. And by the way, my father was mentally ill and I saw what happened to my father and eventually my father almost became like a homeless man because of his mental illness and the inability for him to be able to get treatment and stuff and, and the poverty into which it forced my family because of my father's mental illness. But anyway, I, I persevered. I, I did get my college degree. I went on to get a, a master's degree at City College in education and I became the director of a daycare center on 125th Street and Amsterdam Avenue in Harlem where I learned a lot of my community organizing skills. And I learned how to relate to people other than myself. Obviously Harlem is an African American community. Uh, and so I worked very hard in, those community, in that community to uh, get some of those organizing skills. But the money wasn't so great in daycare. And at that time, they weren't really hiring in the Department of Education. But I knew that as soon as they opened up, I would go to the Department of Education. And I did. And I left Harlem and I went to School District 24, which is Middle Village, Glendale, Maspeth. And even to this day, it's a fairly conservative area. And um, in 1992, my school board, in those days they had individual school boards, came out against a curriculum called the Children of the Rainbow Curriculum. Now that curriculum was designed to teach tolerance of all of New York's diverse communities. And it was in response to um, the murder of African American men in Howard Beach and in Bensonhurst by white supremacists who had gone out and hunted down these men. Also, there was a young gay man, Latino man in Jackson Heights named Julio Rivera, who was also quote unquote hunted for by three white supremacist skinheads who went out hunting to um, find a gay guy. And they murdered him on the corner of the street where I currently live. And that was a time that really, that was a moment that in my life that galvanized our community. We decided not to be invisible anymore and we came out and we marched in the streets for the very first time to bring attention to the crime because there had been other murders of gay people but basically the police didn't pay attention. In fact, when Julio was murdered, the police gave the case to a detective who was on vacation for two weeks. They put no value on his life whatsoever. So that would have meant the detective wouldn't even start to investigate until he came back from his vacation uh, and um, and, and then begin to do that investigation. But when I came out in the, in the public school system, I was one of the first teachers to do so, my school board immediately went after me and tried to remove me from the classroom. They wrote memos on, on letterhead uh, saying that I was a pervert, that they wanted me removed. I taught in Sunnyside, and this was, I thought, very creative. They wanted the teacher from Sunnyside removed to the shady side of the street and, um, you know, but um, this was all done on official letterhead and I filed human rights complaints. They never were taken seriously. They said that what happened to me did not rise to the level of discrimination. School board members came into my classroom to observe me and to try to harass me and stood in my face like this while I was teaching. School board members came into my classroom to remove books on multiculturalism. School board members came into my classroom to remove a book called I Hate English, which was about a little girl who came to school and the first time she says, I hate English, I hate English. And then by the end of like six months of being in an American school system, she learned to love English and she says, I love English. I guess they only read the title and they never got to the end of the book, you know. So, but this was, the, you know, they were equal opportunity haters, let me put it that way, you know. And, um, and, and fortunately, they were never successful. Fortunately, I had tenure, and they were never able to remove me from the school system. Uh, another incident of discrimination that I faced was when I went to try to buy a co-op. Uh, by this time, um, I had started the Queens Lesbian and Gay Pride Parade, which happens up to this year. We're gonna have our 22nd one in Jackson Heights on 37th Avenue on June 2nd. Um, and the woman um, who I was applying to, the, the, the board of the co-op, saw a letter of recommendation that said, um, you know, I've been very involved in the community. And they said, well, how have you been involved in the community? 
And I figured, well, this is 2000, the year 2000. I said, let me be truthful with her. And I said, well, I organized the Queen's Pride Parade. And she says to me, you run that thing? You bring those people into this neighborhood? Oh, my God. She said, I can't believe you bring people in here from Jamaica. Could you? <laughs> so all of the isms were in her statement right there. And it was just unbelievable. I called back two weeks later and found out that I had been denied the apartment. Um, and actually some of the other board members who were sitting in that room, kind of their mouths, their jaws dropped because they couldn't believe that this woman was going on like that. Um, when I ran for office, um, I uh, faced a, a terrible campaign of homophobia where they distributed leaf leaflets uh, in Left Rack City, um, you know, saying don't vote for the homo and all of these other types of things slipped under people's doors on the night before the election. Well, of course, I'd always been open about it, but they just tried to distort the campaign and to use it for other reasons. When I did become chair, and when I did become elected, I was asked what committee did I want to chair? And, you know, representing Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, I have a large immigrant community there. And I always try to make connections into the immigrant communities because I believe that we all need to coalesce in order to fight all of the isms. And so that's really how I got elected. I defeated an incumbent because I had fingers into every, every community. So I asked for the Immigration Committee. And I have to tell you, since being chair of the Immigration Committee, I have seen so much prejudice and discrimination against our immigrant communities. It's unbelievable. I used to think the last vestige of acceptable discrimination in America was against LGBT people. I now believe that it is against our immigrants, and particularly our undocumented immigrants. So that is an issue of major concern to me. I am now re-elected in my second term and um, I'm getting revenge on the Department of Education because I am now the chair of the Education Committee with oversight abilities over the Department of Education. And our first hearing, well, we did something on pre-K, but the first hearing that I'm selecting will be on February 25th, and it's going to be on how the Department of Education, um, what they do for LGBT students, families, and teachers. And, um, Finally, I want to say another area of particular interest for me is also prison reform. So I'm working on a number of issues, particularly the issue of solitary confinement, uh, which also is a whole nother, other issue uh, where they, in Rikers Island, confine thousands of people, mentally ill, substance abusers, basically, for long periods of time, 180 plus days, in cells for 23 hours a day, oftentimes for 24 hours a day. But because of my background and where I've come from and how I got to where I am, I feel that it's necessary to fight for those things, education, immigration rights, and for prisoners' rights as well. And so that's what brings me here today to a conference like this, and that's why I'm grateful to have this opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you. It was great speeches, you guys. <laughs> um, as a mother, as a mother, and as a student as well, I heard all you speak regarding offenders and criminals, and especially in our community. I would like to ask, how can you divide? Because I believe in new opportunities, especially as humans, we make mistakes. But there's offenders, child abusers, um, people that kill innocent children and things that shouldn't be like, treated as mistakes. How can you divide that with people that are criminals and as well have new opportunities? How can you divide that in a way that we can see as a good thing? Well, let me, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll try to address that a little bit. Um, you know, um, one of the things that we don't offer in our prison system is rehabilitation. 
we don't have rehabilitative services. We punish. And, and, and that's not really a way to get to correction, quote unquote. So I think really one of the objectives that I have as a council member is to, um, uh, to have services that are available. Now the governor just proposed that we offer college courses to those who are incarcerated so that they can get jobs when they get out, so that they can have lives when they, when they leave the system. And that's a benefit to society as well. If all we do is lock people up for long periods of time, when they get out, they're going to continue to remain, as you have suggested, a threat to society. So what we need are rehabilitative services for those who are currently incarcerated so when they become ex-offenders, when they come out of prison, they don't recommit those types of crimes. There are, by the way, some laws in New York City, even in the Department of Education, where those who do have an arrest record are allowed to work uh, in certain circumstances. Um, I actually was arrested three times, um, and um, I was approved to be a teacher, and obviously when I ran for city council, that came up in, 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 in my run as well. Um, so I'm a deep believer as well in giving people second chances. I also had drinking and substance abuse uh, issues. But people can turn their lives around. And so I feel like my role as a council member is to continue to provide opportunities for people to have second, third, and fourth chances. I just wanted to add to that, that um, echoing you, is that some people do need to be inside. But, it's, but we need to also provide them services. But please don't get me wrong, some people definitely need to be inside. And a former practitioner in criminal justice, I've seen the system do a lot of good things to some people. Um, so I just wanted to add that, okay? My question is, because you're part of the Department of Education, how do you feel about, like for me, I went to Sheepset Bay High School, which is now closed down. And a lot of Brooklyn high schools are getting closed down. I feel like the way that they treat the children in the school is what makes them go to prison. So how do you see yourself changing the way that they, that they treat our teenagers? Because it's, it's high school that prepares you for prison. Well, you're absolutely right, and that's called the school-to-prison pipeline. It's become very uh, popular to, in education circles to talk about that. And in fact, that's what has happened. We've seen so much of that go on, and I believe that why it's gone on is because of the, the makeup of our public school system, which is mostly children of color. And there has been a lot of ignoring of the public school system because of them being the other. If we had rich white folks who had invested their kids' lives in the public school system, I don't really think the public school system would be what the public school system has become. Now that being said, what can we do to change it? Well, just yesterday I met with um, the small schools sports uh, league people. So for example, in most schools they have the PSAL, the public school athletic league. Uh, but in the smaller schools, which the Bloomberg administration has been fond of promoting, you know, they close down the larger high schools, they put two or three little schools, but only the largest school in the building gets the sports programs. The other schools don't get it. So that is unfair. And the, the mo most kids in the smaller schools are youth of color. So it's, most of those kids are not getting the sports program. Now you talk to anybody, any rich people, Jamie Dimon from Chase Manhattan Bank or whatever, and one of the things that they'll always tell you about their experiences in high schools is how they were involved in teams and after school programs and, and things like that. So one of the objectives of my committee is to provide more after school programs, to provide an environment that's more supportive. We're working on a get your child to college program. You know, there are more school safety officers, folks, than there are guidance counselors in the New York City Department of Education. 
Okay, that is an incredible fact. Guidance counselors sometimes carry a caseload of one guidance counselor to a thousand students. How can you get kids into college when guidance counselors have those type of caseloads? So they, we're working on reducing that down to 250, which is still high, but we're looking at the budget also, which restricts us somewhat in what it is that we can do. So there are a number of programs like that to address the issues that you're bringing up, which are really very, very important. I, I went to John Bound High School, and something which she said also, I feel like, you know when we have scanning randomly, like three times a year, random, why is it that they like, they like, um, what is it? They like count out the minority, which are Hispanics and black people, than those who like are white people or whatever. I'm both. When they do scanning, they take over millions of people's phones for no reason when they should be focusing on guns. My school, we had a couple guns in during the scanning, knives and everything, and they focus mainly on cell phones. Then we got to stay after school getting our phones. I don't understand, like, what was the point of that? Like, the phone. I agree with you. I think it's a ridiculous law, and I would like to see that uh, cell phones are allowed in the public schools. And actually, in some instances where we've seen shootings, these mass shootings where, where people come in and they do these horrible things, if people had cell phones, it might have been helpful to them to locate them or to notify the police as well. I think there has to be some regulations about use of the cell phone in the classroom. Obviously, you don't want the cell phone ringing when you're in the middle of teaching. Having been a teacher, I don't want that to go on as well. But it shouldn't be a system where children think that they're walking into a prison when they're in fact walking into a school. And that's what it's become. We spend $22.7 million a year on school safety agents and on scanners in our schools. I have a proposal which would at least for temporarily and in a project program take 1% of that $2.27 million and put it into getting more guidance counselors and support for our youth in the public schools. That's the way I think we should be going. back on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to speak to that idea about our perception of communities and neighborhoods a little bit. I think, uh, I think we very often confuse uh, urban decay with moral decay. We think if the, the building is broken down, then the people inside are broken down. So it really does start with conversations like this to flip our perception. You know, we were talking in class this morning, what would happen if police did community service? And somebody said that it would like make our heads explode. It would like blow someone's mind, you know, but why, but why not? Why, why is that a revolutionary idea? Uh, maybe we could free, reframe the way we see each other, particularly the youth in New York City, particularly our young people. Like I said, with stop and frisk, most, a wide majority of who we stop is uh, under 24, under 21 even. We're talking about stopping 12 and 14 year olds on the way to school, not all 12 and 14 year olds. It's completely disproportionate. Um, you know, and, and on that idea of perception, if we take, if we look at the number of violent crime per year, just to give a simple example, if we look at the number of violent crime per year in uh, Crown Heights, it's about 4.9 violent crimes per thousand people in North Crown Heights. It's about 6.3 in South Crown Heights, okay? Then we think of Park Slope, where our new mayor is from, and we think of Park Slope as a more affluent neighborhood, okay? There's three violent crimes per year, per thousand people. That's only a difference of, of one, but our thinking about Crown Heights, East New York, vastly different than our thinking about Park Slope. Another example is Uptown, Morningside Heights, near Harlem. Morningside Heights is 44% white, 56% non-white, they have about 6.3 violent crimes per thousand people per year. The Upper West Side, right there, we're talking about just walking across the block. Actually, racially, 
very close. It's about 60% white to 40% non-white. Our thinking about the neighborhood, though, very different. And again, the violent crimes on the Upper West Side, it's about two per thousand people. Now, that's less, yes, but not in our mind the difference. There's a huge gulf. It's like the Grand Canyon between our thinking about the Upper West and the Upper East and parts of the Bronx or parts of Brooklyn. But the, the actual numbers of crime, we don't see that. But we are treating, especially our young people in those areas, very, very differently. And it develops an us versus them attitude that is absolutely toxic to community. And it's not, it's not safe for our young people. It's not safe for our police either on the, on the other side of it if we're all looking at each other in, in an antagonistic way, right? Just thinking about that idea of perception. I, I guess I will. And I guess the two questions are kind of related is, why are we getting no support and instead getting tons of security to <laughs> kind of scare everyone into place? I think just my own cynical answer is money. Uh, it takes an amazing amount, a huge amount of money to get someone from birth to college in terms of like well, healthcare, daycare, education, uh, the amount of time you have to spend on homework. And for a lot of rich people, that money comes from family and everyone seems happy. Um, but when the rest of us uh, are relying on government money, if I'm, you know, if I have a budget and I need to spend $20 million on, on a system, and I only have 10, and I want to keep my job, I want to I have to come up with some way to at least have the appearance of doing a lot of it so I can make everyone happy, I can make everyone uh, feel good. And if I can say the right words, if I can frame it the right way, it can appear like a lot of things are being done that are good and positive and beneficial, uh, where the, the rot and the decay comes from underneath. So that's kind of my cynical answer to like, why is why is public school so horrible? I was there too. <laughs> I know. Uh, you have another. Do you have a question? I have a problem. Because me being Dominican, it's like Dominican black, we're all like the same. Spanish. You guys, I want to say you guys, I mean the city, they profile us to be such bad people. We're dangerous, we're violent, we're this and the third. But when you really look in the news, who kills babies? <laughs> who kills kids? Who goes and shoot up schools? It's not the blacks. It's not the Hispanics. So why are we the ones that's getting so punished when these are things that we wouldn't even do? You don't hear about these things happening in Park Slope High School, in Sheepshead Bay, in any of the schools here. Mm -hmm. But we're the ones who's getting punished more. We don't need the security. The other schools do. I, I, I think it goes back to the whole idea of perception. Mm -hmm. You know, these terrible shootings that have occurred in high schools, fortunately, knock on wood, have not happened in New York City because we are accustomed somewhat to more diverse communities, and it doesn't happen for those reasons. Mm -hmm. In those other communities where they're, where they're not as accustomed to it, that's where you see these shootings and that terrible bullying that goes on as well. And I want to thank our students and our faculty who are here. I'm glad that we're having this conversation in the Kupferberg Holocaust Center because it points to what happens when we don't look at a person as a person, when we don't see, and it's important. I think each one of the speakers has made that, that very important point. So I thank you. And I especially want to thank the speakers. I was very, very intrigued by the comments. And I hope that uh, our students took something away today for you to think about and talk amongst yourselves. So thank you. And thank to all the faculty who organized this. Kiki, Susan, thank you. President Call. So I'd like to thank you all, the panelists. And then let's give a round of applause to all our speakers. <laughs> And thank you for coming here. And then now I'll let you go to your next class. Oh, Professor Fluke, want to say something? No. no. Okay, so thank you very much. And I'll see you in our next program. Oh,